Chelsea, I am, I don't have the words to communicate um, just what an absolute gift it is to sit with you today. So thank you so much for making the time. To thank be you on for having show. me. Thank you. Um, I told my audience, and we just talked about this before I hit record, that I met you in like a Baja Fresh three years ago. And yeah, Baja life, Fresh. I couldn't remember. I was like, was it a Cadoba or a Chipotle? But I remember there was there was Pico de Gallo involved. So I'm sorry to the Baja Fresh aficionados that I didn't remember the and type you, of like Mexican restaurant. Right. You were literally like the coolest human and your uh, your team at the time was like, oh, let me take your phone. I'll put my, our, our, our contact in your, in your phone so you could have her on your podcast. And then she was like, Kath, your, your phone screen is really messy. And I was like, note to self, you might meet Chelsea Clinton at Baja Fresh, <laughs> clean your screen, just clean it. Anyways, I'm so happy you're here. That's an understatement. So I want to ask you a couple of questions because people know you so well, but they really don't know you, right? We just like have been sort of in awe of your entire life and grew up with you, especially me. We're about the same age. So first question to you is like, what was it like for you to live your life while we're watching you live your life? Like, what was it like for you to grow up in such a powerful vibration and have the whole world looking at you all the time? Well, thankfully I didn't think about the whole world looking at me all the right. time, even if they were maybe looking at me all the time. And I'm really thankful to you, know, my parents first and foremost, and also you know my grandparents and my teachers and the other adults who were in my life who really tried to give me like as normal an experience as possible. And that, you know, my parents ensured, you know, I had chores and also that I could feel comfortable having my friends over and that we could cook in the kitchen and, you know, that we had a kind of as normal a life as possible, like, you know, in the governor's mansion in Arkansas and then in the White House. And yet that I also was aware of what an enormous like privilege and responsibility it was to be living in these historic spaces, to be, you know, supporting my parents in whatever ways I could as a, as a kid and then as a teenager. Um, and that I felt, you know, you talk about being in awe. I felt so um, proud and sometimes in awe of my parents and also all the people that they worked with who were trying to make, you know, our state better when we were in Arkansas to help make our country, you know, better and healthier and more sustainable and more equitable and more just and like all the things I knew they were working so hard for. And yet I could hold that like awe and admiration and pride for them alongside like, oh, I still have to make sure I'm on time for school and do my homework and like be respectful and keep my room clean and go to church and like show up for yearbook or like whatever <laughs> I signed up for as the activity that year. Um, and I'm really thankful to my parents for helping me kind of recognize the extraordinary and yet also be as kind of ordinary um, as possible. It's really, um, I don't know what I would have expected you to say, but as you started to speak, it was like, oh, I didn't expect you to say those things. Like, and you had chores to do. And it's like, of course you did. And it brought me to tears because the world turns people into like characters in a video game. And of course, there's so many people who are become obsessed with people, right? They're like, they don't just love you guys. They're obsessed. And then there's people who have other opinions. But at the end of the day, I think what brought me to tears is that your real human beings who've raised your hands to be leaders, which takes so much courage and humility to be a real human willing to sacrifice so much to do your best to try to make something better. And I think we can so lose sight of that because things kind of become like caricatures of what they are. And it's like really like, it's hard to put into words how, how inspiring that is. Well, I mean, thank you for saying that. And also I just want to acknowledge how blessed and lucky I've been my whole life to have wonderful friends 
Um, my oldest friend in the world um, is six weeks older than I am. Our mothers met in Lama's class. <laughs> and so I think, and I also thankfully have wonderful friends, you know, from high school and college and professional life. I think though that, you know, my lifelong friends and those relationships also helped me always feel like there was a safe space for me to be, um, you know, my full self and to be vulnerable and to ask questions and to be asked hard questions and to keep me humble. And that, that I think has always been really grounding and kind of rooting for me, um, as well as of course, like the example of my parents and the kind of structures and rules we had at home. And then, you know, also that I was fiercely close to my grandmothers, um, who, you know, always were so good about ensuring that like I understood what was really important in life. And certainly part of what was really important in life, you know, Kathy, to what you were saying earlier was like to not be a caricature and to always be kind and to always be mindful of um, kind of, you know, to whom uh, much is given, much is expected and should be expected. Um, and And that either I could like, you know, cower away or try to um, kind of recognize that in a in a lived way in a practical way in a way that hopefully um, was was positive and good and and generative so yeah. also mindful of yes thankfully um, my parents but also my friends and my grandparents and kind of everyone else who was you know part of my village growing up yeah there's that village thing again but um yeah, it's, you know <laughs> it's village but um it's so beautiful. And I feel like, I love that you mentioned your grandparents. That's like, so like hits me in the heart. My grandmother was definitely my biggest influence. And I think about how, yes, the realness. And also I think people reach for the highest branches they can see. And one of the most, and I'm going to really try not to cry when I say all these things, because it's really, the stakes are just so high, you know, and I have the responsibility I have to all these amazing women who listen to the show. And so I feel what I'm saying on such a deep level, right? I'm not just saying it to be nice, but it's like, yes, there's the realness. And then there's the showing people a higher branch, which in most people's lives, I feel like we're wearing this virtual reality headset that just shows, especially women for a long time, what's possible. And in that what's possible, there's not that much possible. And I feel that it is so significant how much history will look back and show what it is. And you've been writing books about this, about women who are changing the world. And you're obviously one of those women and you come from those women. What would you want people to hear who might say, yeah, yeah, but you're you, right? It's not possible for me. And really the only reason you and all these other women, I think, and your mother are reaching as high is because it's a come with me. It's not a look at me. It's, you know, we're all going in this direction, but what about when people still, they're so in this this other idea that that's not quite possible, that there's definitely just not that much available for women to fully rise. What well, what would you want them to know? Oh goodness, Kathy. Well, I think, um, you know, I would never say to anyone, I wouldn't have like, you know, hopefully the hubris or the arrogance to say like, this is what should inspire you, or this is what <laughs> should galvanize you or motivate you. I also so deeply resonate like in my marrow with the um with the reality that it is hard for any of us to imagine what we can't see. And so, you know, part of what has been so imperative to me as a writer, as an advocate is to try to help close that imagination gap for all of us to try to help write women kind of into history who haven't been included to help kind of elevate and amplify women today who I think are doing, you know, extraordinary work, whether in kind of, you know, public advocacy or science or arts or culture or sports, who I want my daughter and my sons to look up to and to feel like, oh, like 
I can, I can learn something from those examples, whether I want to try to kind of prove what's possible in the same vein or field, or I want to just take that kind of sense of, you know, not being limited by what others have expected of me and kind of being persistent and being inspired by these examples toward whatever kind of journey and ambition, because it's not wrong for women to be ambitious, like that feels kind of right and good and resonant for me and what I want to see happen in the world. What I want to prove is, is possible through my own kind of lives and action. And I also, Kathy, recognize like, you know, what, what you say is also true that many of us and me included have a, you know, a huge swath of advantages of yeah. being born in the United States Oh yeah, of huge. having, of having gone to awesome public and then private schools of having like safe public parks to plan right. of growing up in the eighties when there were significantly fewer guns than there are today of having two parents and multiple grandparents involved yes. in my life and having, you know, safe uh, places to kind of find myself, whether that was on a softball field or, you know, at a ballet bar or with the Girl Scouts or through my youth ministry at church, like so many things that I was kind of blessed with and privileged to have that so many people don't have. And so I think that it is hugely important um, to have the kind of humility and the honesty to recognize that mm -hmm. and acknowledge that. And I also think about, you know, my grandmothers um, who you were saying you were very close to your grandmother, my grandmothers who um, had none of that really. I mean, my, my dad's mom who um, went back to school after her husband had died when she was pregnant with my father after he was born, had to leave him with family and put herself mm -hmm. through nursing school so that she could earn enough money to be able to provide him the life that she wanted him to have and a better life than what she had had in terms of yeah. kind of more opportunities and more options. Or I think about my mom's mom, who was abandoned by her parents and then abandoned by her grandparents oh and had to, work to support herself starting at 13. And she had no models of like a loving family in her life. And yet she created one for my mom and her brothers. And so I do know. Well, um, I never knew that story. That's an oh, really important context. It is. And it also, I think, helps explain why my mom has dedicated her life to trying to help support um, women and children, because she very much was aware of how a teacher changed her mother's life and then changed her life. And so mindful of my. Um, blessing and privileges and all of those that my grandmothers did not have, I just then feel even more responsible yeah. um, for doing what I can to try to help change kind of the policies and the practices to help yeah. make it easier for everyone and also to help kids not have the imagination gap, mm -hmm. um, to be able to see themselves as anything and everything. Yeah. That was so beautiful. And I want to get to your newest book in a moment, but to piggyback on what you're saying, and I want to ask you about this. So this audience of mine is pretty much 99% women who 85% of them went to four-year universities and they want so much to be in their fullest expression of themselves. And so we recently had a retreat in Malibu with about a hundred of them who flew in from mostly around the country, but some from around the world. And the only man who happened to be at the event was the photographer. And he was witnessing women getting up and speaking and connecting and sharing. And there was breath work and meditation and all these things. And he pulled me aside at the end and he said, I've never seen men do this. I've never seen men get together and get up and share and cry and support each other. And he said, this was so beautiful. Like it brought me to tears. And this woman came in from Pakistan and I'm Jewish and she's Muslim. And she got up and said, who would have thought that me growing up so far away would one day be standing here and feel that of all the people I've ever met, you, a Jewish girl who grew up here, 
has taught me to believe in myself in a way that I never had. And she said, Kathy, I had this image of you and me sitting with so many women in Jerusalem, she said, where I've never gone. And she's like, I just think I had this knowing that I can't play small anymore because women coming together and rising can really change the world. And the photographer was witnessing this and we were all in tears. And this is just one moment, but it's a really powerful moment. And we talked about how girls in general, and I'm definitely generalizing, but tend to play a little bit small. There's, I work with a lot of women who seem to feel that they want to be humble. They want to have integrity. And there's a false sense a little bit that the bigger they would be, the more of a platform they would have, the more of a voice they might have. Somewhere along the way, they might lose this, I want to be a good person. What if I had more coming into me, more eyes on me, more money coming through, more power, would I lose my humility? And would I not be able to be a good mother? Would I not be able to be a good wife? And this is a conversation I have all the time. And then I look at the world and say, it really does seem like it'd be nice if there were more women leaders. And I really do think that this woman Taktis who stood up is, she has a, a really good point that women can make a really big impact because of certain kinds of ways we do relate to other people naturally. So I'm curious what you would say when women feel that there's a cost of being as in their full expression, but does that cost them being a good mother? Does it cost them their integrity on some level? I do think that's something that people are worried about. And I think, um, Kathy, part of what is you know, particularly painful about, you know, the story you just shared from your retreat, which I imagine there were kind of many similar stories in that yeah. kind of moment of community is how universal it often is that, you know, women are told that we should be quieter and smaller and deferential. And certainly, you know, I um, have struggled in my life too, to think, you know, how do I be fully myself while like not be like fill in the blank thing that I'm worried about that maybe, you know, I do need to be particularly attentive to because I always want to be mindful of again, like all the privileges and advantages that I've had. And I do think it's important to start from a place of humility when you are so privileged and also that I've been socialized um, even with my amazing role models of my mom and my grandmothers, um, who definitely like, you know, always were giving me kind of books and audio books to like read and listen to with like fear, strong, you know, girl and women, like central characters, but still like, you know, we are in the environments that we grow up in, in which like, you know, in the eighties and nineties, there were still like, fewer speaking parts for girls and women in television shows and movies in which like the little mermaid was the most popular, like, you know, cartoon for a few years in which a woman is literally giving away her voice. So, you know, I, I just think those of us who have platforms, who may have larger voices, as you were saying, Kathy, also have to be honest about like that. We still struggle with some of these questions that we are still kind of navigating how to answer them kind of retrospectively and contemporaneously and to have the humility kind of of that honesty and yet not to be so caught up in the answering of those that we are not kind of fully realizing our, our potential and our purpose and our ability to have a positive impact, whether that's on kind of our our audience or an issue or, you know, a business or kind of with, within the world of our, our families. And so I think it's just such an important conversation that we all need to be engaged with in an ongoing way. Mm -hmm. um, and to, and to do so from a place of kind of honesty and vulnerability and also kind of support and encouragement for one another to be able to kind of lift up and, and carry one another when we all will need that at some point. Yeah. And I also, you know, Kathy, as you were 
speaking, was thinking about how I do believe um, we can do many things in life. And that also it is impossible to do everything that we want to do at the same time. And so, you know, for me, as a, as a parent of three young kids in which like being a mom is not the only part of my identity, it is though the most important part of my identity. And so it does mean that I am thankfully um, with an amazing team, some of whom you met and that <laughs> like Baja Fresh, you know, I'm able to do so much, but I don't get to do, I don't, I don't get to write every book I want to write, you know, in every month that I may feel yeah. compelled to write them yeah. or to have every podcast conversation that I may want to have on any given day or to work on like every initiative, not only at the Clinton Foundation, but that I otherwise support like in any given like period of time. It, I hope will all get done, but sometimes it just has to take longer yeah. um, because I want my kids to always know that they are um, the focal point of life. Yeah. and the most important part of life and they get organized around. Well, it's so beautiful that you are doing it. And I don't know that anyone has an actual exact balance, but balancing whatever is even out of balance is, is a thing. And, you know, my mom was so unfulfilled because she said she had to give up what she wanted to be a mother. And she was so happy she did, but I always knew how much she wanted to express her gifts. And so I'm so grateful that you're a model in this way. And you're writing books about it and you're writing books for moms. And so this newest book that's now coming out, Welcome to the Big Kids Club, What Every Older Sibling Needs to Know. I mean, you've spoken about being a mom and you have a lot of things to say about parenting and just your going through it. Why did you want to talk about this particular topic? Why was this so important to you to write a book about it? So when uh, Charlotte, who's my oldest, became a big sister the first time she was just 20 months old when her baby brother Aiden was born. And then when Aiden became a big brother for the first time and Charlotte became a big sister, um, kind of times two, um, there was a more than three year, um, gap between Aiden and Jasper, although I didn't know that I was having a boy when I was pregnant. And Charlotte and Aiden had so many questions about, about the new baby and Charlotte was quite, um, proprietary. Like she definitely <laughs> was like, so this is our baby. And initially I was kind of like, well, this is like your sibling and my baby. And then I'm like, no, like this is actually <laughs> really lovely that she thinks like, this is like the family baby. Also, please don't think of like the new baby as a pet, but also like, this is <laughs> lovely. And so and just got you through those different conversations and the way the kids were asking questions and what questions they were asking. I, I thought like, this should be a book. Like we are not the only family having these conversations. We're not the only family in which kind of an older sibling or maybe multiple older siblings are feeling like, well, this is our baby too. Like this baby's coming to our family. Um, and so I decided, you know, to write the book, um, reflecting on those conversations and the questions that kids asked and also mindful that big siblings do often, because I now have talked to lots of parents and some big siblings do often feel like, oh, like this is our baby or this is my baby, just as much as it may be, you know, my mom's baby. It's so beautiful. And I'm so, like I said, happy that you're writing this book because while everything you just said is true, that being a mom means that you can't always do every single thing you want to be doing. I often wonder like, if there's so much resonance when you are doing what you're doing that you can still make such an impact with whatever time you can give to things. And I do think part of the culture is a little bit in this like obsession with hustle and like the amount of hours needing to be spent, especially at a desk or outside the home. And that's all changing with COVID now too. And like Zoom calls. And I think that there's a reality in which women can look at you and read these books and see how much time you've been able to dedicate to being a parent and thinking about these kinds of questions while contributing and adding your voice to so many other things. And I think it's time to just change that story of what it needs to look like to be uh, a powerful leader that you need to work 12 hour days and get on a jet and right in your 
by 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 writing books like this you know it's not just like oh we're we're aware that Chelsea Clinton is a mother it's like no she's really invested in being a mom and making sure that these relationships are really paramount in her life and she's also doing all of those other things and so I think it's so beautiful I have three kids also and these are really important conversations that I don't think people really hear enough. So what's one thing that when people read this book, if there was just one thing that you felt like, I'm glad they took that away. If you could boil it down, I know that's not always easy, but I mean it. Like, what is that one note that you hope they hear? Oh, goodness, Kathy. Well, um, I think to to listen to your kids' questions and and to you know, and to be responsive to them. And, and in the text, uh, welcome to the big kids club. Like I knew, um, some of those answers, but some of them I thought, oh gosh, like I have to double check with our pediatrician. Like I think <laughs> I might know the answer, but I might not know the answer to these questions. And so, you know, I kept a, a running log. We have a, a family a journal that I write, um, I try to do it every week. Doesn't make it every week, but at least like every, you know, couple of weeks or few weeks. And so when I was working on this book, like I went back and I just really looked at like all the questions and the answers. And I'm so um I'm 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 such a believer in in listening to our kids and and in the kind of the validation that kids get when we listen to them, you know, a validation of their, of their curiosity, a validation of their right to ask questions, you know, including of, and especially of their, of their parents. And so, you know, of course, I hope that, you know, this book can help answer questions that kids have about becoming big siblings, or maybe they're newly big siblings, you know, hope that it helps um, inform and inspire conversations in families but if I had to pick one thing, since that is what you asked, mm -hmm. I hope that it just reminds all of us as kind of parents and caregivers to listen to our kids' question, answer them to the best of our abilities, and then ask for help too, kind of when we don't know the answers, because that's an important role modeling for our kids as well, that, you know, we may know a lot of answers, but we don't know all the answers. No one does. Okay. So last question. I wish I had to all day to just hang out with you because you're so awesome. Invite me back. Invite me back. Okay. I love you. Um, the last question is I was just going to ask you, since I think people, especially coming out of COVID, there's just so much exhaustion and people feel how divided the country is and all of those things are just so real, like more real than ever. I'm just curious in you, in your heart, in your mind, as you walk around and you go to get coffee and you push your kids in the stroller. Do you feel hopeful? Do you feel like we're going to turn the ship around? Do you feel like this is still like the most incredible country in the world? Like, I'm just curious, like in your heart, when you go to sleep at night, what maybe you could say that, and honestly, doesn't have to be fake. Like, I'm just curious what you actually think. Oh yeah. About. Kathy, I don't, I'm terrible at fake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I is, just meant um, you don't have to cheer people up if that's not how you feel. Yeah, no, I am. I am both quite afraid and also quite hopeful. I also do have a lot of hope because we do have people who are trying to you know, tackle mis disinformation so that we can have a more coherent, honest kind of shared reality from which to move forward, you know, hopefully more together. We do have people, you know, fighting to defend and protect human rights and women's rights. We do have voters in Kansas showing up to say, um, no, like we are not going to take away um, a woman's ability to access the health care that she and her doctors believe are the important kind of rights and opportunities and options for her to have. Um, we do have more young people saying climate change is real and human activity is contributing to that. And we need to be responsive to that. And we have, you know, President Biden signing legislation um, to help make massive investments in trying to protect our planet. So I have so much hope because of so mm -hmm. much that young and maybe not so young people are doing to try to help 
kind of protect and defend our democracy and human rights and the sustainability of our planet and to make the world you know more equitable and just and healthier and also um there is a lot that uh i am afraid of and concerned about and so i can hold both those fears mm -hmm. and that hope and optimism um at the same time and just want to direct my energy to try to help uh, ameliorate the fears and increase uh, the reasons for optimism in whatever ways I can, you know, as an author and an advocate and beyond. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. I really do feel like if you hold something in the noonday sun, it's like the greater the light, the greater the shadow. And I can feel there's so much awakening and there's an equal amount, right, of contrast. And I just want to say thank you because you are real. You're a human being and you've lived through everything and more that we don't even know that you've lived through. And to just see how steadfast you are and kind and generous and humble, given just the amount of intensity you've gone through as a just a human being, putting one foot in front of the other the word remarkable with a capital R doesn't, it doesn't do it. So um, it's really an honor. I'm like really moved and tell everybody where they can support your foundation, tell everyone where they can follow you and, and buy the book soon. Oh gosh. Well, thank you, Kathy. Yes, please. You could absolutely find out um, more at uh, clintonfoundation.org about all of our work. Um, I hope that you will share Welcome to the Big Kids Club uh, with young people in your lives. And you can find that at your local bookstore or online at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. And you can uh, find me uh, most prolifically um, on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram, admittedly, or kind of other um, kind of video-based platform. But uh, you can find me at Chelsea Clinton on Twitter. And I hope, uh, Kathy, you'll have me back again because this was such a fun conversation. And I really enjoyed it so much. That means so much to me. And um, thank you. And thank you to your whole team for making this happen. Yes, you're thank amazing. you, everybody in the background. Yeah, you're amazing. Thank you, Chelsea. To be continued. Be continued. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Great Kathy. Job. Hey, bye, honey.